What's up, my sweaties? You are here with some very special Collider Hero special. It's the Road to Apocalypse. It's the Road to X-Men Apocalypse. We're going to go through all of the X-Men feature films, talk a little bit about them, and joining me are Robert Meyer Burnett and Amy Dallin. What's going on, guys? Hello. I'm ready to get all X'd up. Yep, let's X it up. X I'm going to do you up. it. X it up. Yo, and, and started, speaking of X-Men, it's 2016. Let's get into the time machine and go back to the year 2000. And that is the year that we got the very first X-Men movie, simply titled X-Men. Now, this was a pretty fantastic thing. I know some, some of you watching this were probably born in the year 2000, but check it out. This was like one of the very first superhero films that actually wasn't really afraid to be a superhero film. Now, granted, DC was way ahead of the game. They did Superman the movie, Superman 2. They had the Batman film in 1989. And we really didn't have that much for another 10 years. We had, you know, we had Batman Returns. We had a couple of really bad Superman sequels. We had The Phantom. We had The Shadow. We had some other ones we don't even want to talk about. Um, then we had Blade. That came out, I believe, in 1999. That was like, a lot of people didn't even know that Blade was part of the Marvel Universe because he's fighting vampires, but it was a big hit. And then we got this film. I think this film was something that a lot of the producers who were making it were afraid of. They were like, what is this thing that we're making Singer, what are you doing to us? Are you trying to ruin our company? Like, you know, it's like a lot of people were afraid of superhero films and they were especially afraid of them being taken seriously. Everything had to have that Batman-y, like, well, look, you know, Batman was, you know, the Tim Burton Batman was taken seriously, but everything wasn't like, I think X-Men put it on the map, like the ability that you can take these characters seriously. What do you think, Robert? Your thoughts on X-Men? Oh, well, you know, you got to love a movie that opens in Auschwitz. Oh, you know, sure. I mean, X-Men 1, I don't mean to make light of that. I'm sorry. Um, but it opens in Auschwitz when right. you see you see what happens to Magneto as a young boy. And uh, I think the the setting that up immediately tells you what you need to know about Magneto mm -hmm. and why he's he's got a healthy distrust of of homo sapiens and always will and it also um, immediately grounds you in this reality and makes it like oh it's a terrifying thing absolutely and you know soon after you see xavier and magneto confront one another there's that great moment at that conference that uh jean gray is speaking at mm -hmm. and you see them as as older men and it immediately sets up a tone that you're not expecting at all from a superhero film and it's and it goes i i've always seen the x-men movies as more science fiction mm -hmm. than regular superhero films. I don't think they're like Superman. I don't think they're like Batman. I think there's something else, mm -hmm. you know, and they're really dealing with what is the nature of humanity through the prism of inhuman mutants. Right. So, but mutants aren't inhuman. They have souls <laughs> just like everyone else. But it, I thought it was a fantastic film. Uh, I really, I loved, even though, look, looking back in hindsight, it's a little goofy now, especially the visual effects. Right. But, I mean, the introduction of the characters when you meet Wolverine and Rogue, I mean, you just love these characters immediately. Yeah, and it's a great, it's a great use of uh, Logan, of Wolverine, using him as the prism to get into the world of the X-Men, of the school of mutants. What are your thoughts on X-Men, Amy? Uh, this is one of those uh, movies that it's easy to overlook its accomplishments now in light of the things that it made possible. Uh, I, you know, people who watch the show have seen me complain about black leather superheroes mm -hmm. a, m a million times, and it's because of movies like this. But the thing that that doesn't take into account is is that it wasn't a safe bet that you could put a movie like this across and get people to care about the ideas that are at the core of these characters. And for me, that's what makes it amazing, is it was a, a proof of concept that you can take stories that work in the comic book page because they have these amazing ideas at their core and translate them for a general audience. That's what's so brilliant about using the Auschwitz opening because it says, look, there's a story going on here. It's the same thing that I love about like Captain America, the first Avenger, where it made people aware like, oh, did they make up all this backstory for the movie? And it's like, no, 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 that's who Steve Rogers is. You care about him because that's a great story behind who he is. And the X-Men have a great story at their heart about outsiders and fearing yourself and being accepted and trying to find a place that you belong and fight to make the world a better place even when it spits in your face. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful story. And this was like the successful putting across of that idea. It wasn't the rogue from the comics, but they created one that we love. The Wolverine was slightly different from the comics, but in all the essential ways he was the one that we love. Uh, they like... 
the, the casting, this was the, the first time that they pulled off the double miracle of casting Charles Xavier and Magneto with absolute perfection, yeah. with actors that you take seriously in the part that mm-hmm. we all, like as kids reading Wizard, we dreamed about these castings and oh, thought yeah. they could never, ever happen. Right. So it set an incredible precedent for real, incredibly talented performers. No offense, the bad performers aren't fake. I'm just saying, these guys are great and they raise the bar for people like taking this material seriously and participating in, in that way. Well, you know, you make a great point. I think that, and people forget, adaptation is what you're doing here. You're mm-hmm. adapting the comic book page to the big screen and people who want to see or feel what they feel or see when they're reading a comic book, the, the, to expect that exactly in a movie doesn't make sense to me. Right. Because the whole medium doesn't take into account the reality of, when you're looking at a four color page, that's one thing. But to try and create a, re, a living, breathing reality on the movie screen is infinitely more difficult. Mm-hmm. And it's infinitely more difficult when you're dealing with characters like this. That you can't just, they're not just people in a room. Now you have to believe that they're extraordinary mutant people in a room. And that's really hard to do, portraying. I mean, everyone said, Wolverine's only five feet tall. Well, if Wolverine was five feet tall and he was shorter than all the other characters in the movie, it would just look strange. I mean, it would be bizarre. Well, I think the more to the case in point is they found the actor who can be Wolverine. And it's like that he's 6'3 or 6'4 or something. It doesn't matter. He's the perfect Wolverine. As we now witness in his 17th year <laughs> playing Wolverine, I think all of you were wrong who back then said, hey, he can't be GST. We're horrible. It's like, but we've experienced, all of us have experienced that. Anybody who's watched comic book movies and the casting procedures over the years have witnessed lots of super fans get really upset. Like just, I'll just mention Heath Ledger. Everyone hated that idea of him as the Joker. And then the movie comes out and then the next year, everyone's dressed as the Joker at every single convention. It's just a thing that happens. I like what your point is with comic books and adaptations into screen. It's happened for years with books. Is you're like, you read a book, you see it all in your mind. And you and it's a book it is like multiple hours of reading and so it's an entire world that you dive into and then the movie itself is maybe a two hours sometimes it's a little over two hours but it can't possibly be the book that you read because i could read a book you could read a book and you could read a book and we all have a different world we all saw different characters we all interpreted every single line delivery differently when you read one line it's how you read it it's not unless you've heard it told to you through a a film that is the ultimate adaptation so i I totally agree with you Rob. well you said like with heath ledger heath ledger does not look at all like the joker in the batman comics his his scarred face is different than falling into a vat of chemicals Mm -hmm. or whatever but that is absolutely still the Joker. Mm-hmm. You re- you recognize that character immediately. You're not going, well, that's not the Joker. Yes, it is. But it's a completely different Joker that's been, what, adapted for the screen. Mm-hmm. And it's done brilliantly. So X-Men, Apo- I'm sorry, not X-Men, Apocalypse, just X-Men in 2000 also had a, a really interesting storyline towards the end that kind of has mutated and moved through all of the X-Men films, even all the way through Apocalypse. I had this storyline where Magneto was like, at the very end of the film, he's got some kind of weird device where he's like, I'm going to turn everyone into mutants. You know, everyone will now have the chance to be homo superior. So I like that weird, you know, it is like, it's like, it isn't exactly mustache twirling, but it was sort of like, it was sort of like, look, I've got this bizarre, you know, kind of like, I don't even remember what it was. It was like like weird thing, a magnetic pulse resonance device of some kind, which will then unlock that every single one of us has our mutant gene, our secret gene that's inside of us that it'll unlock. And ultimately that didn't happen. So, you know, mutants are still very like of a hundred percent. How many percentage points are mutants on the planet? You know, that's a good point. It's 14.748. Right. It's changed a lot over time in the the comics. Uh, They get mass depowered and so on at different points in time. Uh, But I guess I've always assumed it was like something like one percent or half a percent Mm. where there's still thousands upon thousands of them in America alone. I guess that would make millions or half i it's got to be low (laughs) because otherwise it doesn't work but like you you sort of 
And also it's hidden because it's like it doesn't come out usually through puberty is when the mutant power is it comes out. So let's uh, let's Until move Scarlet on. Witch, of course, shows up. Yes. And House of M's it all. Right. Yeah. It takes everybody away. The and then end. there's 198. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about X-Men 2. It's, it was called X2 for a long time. And then it kind of like changed into X2, X-Men United. It came out May 2nd, 2003. We had a big world to play in after the success of the first film. Brian Singer returned with a sure hand in directing the second film and expanding the storyline of Wolverine and his brutal origin by the hands of the dark ops, you know, led by Stryker, played by Brian Cox. Let's talk about X2. Uh, Amy, what are your thoughts on X2? Uh, this, it might still be my my favorite X-Men movie, and it was one of my favorite film-going experiences of all time, because it was, uh, like, I loved the first X-Men movie, but I loved this movie. It was uh, in the manner of Christopher Nolan's films. It was mm. the like the really good first one and the just mind blowing second one. Yeah, that was my experience with with these movies. Uh, and like I still remember at the at the end credits of X two when you uh, first see the sort of phoenix shape appear in the water. Like I have a vivid memory of sitting in that theater set, seat and just being knocked off my butt uh, by the possibilities of where that could go given what a like a largely faithful wonderful story we had just had like i i love this movie robert well i was lucky i was producing the blu-ray or actually pardon me the dvd at the time special features for x2 so i was on set a lot mm. and the sets guy hendrix dias was the production designer and the sets were just astonishing i mean i was hanging out in striker's base and looking at the weapon x chamber that wolverine was actually you know, created it, mm. and and they had put it. It was like in a giant. They converted this giant like Sears warehouse. It was ma- it was just massive. I mean, compared to a, there's nothing. There's no uh, uh, soundstage I've been in that was nearly as big as this. I haven't been to Pinewood, but it was enormous, and it was so much fun to go wa- wandering around on these sets. And the first day I was there, I watched uh, Brian Cox and Professor Xavier square off with Legion. You know, in that room, and. It was, I, I just, I I love this movie so much, I can't even, just like you. I mean, I loved the film. And it was, to be immersed, the actual, in the X world, for me as a longtime X-Men fan, was, uh, it was crazy. And I never thought that they would be able to pull Nightcrawler off. Mm. Mm. I was like, how can they do Nightcrawler? And from the opening attack on the White House, and uh, the, the portrayal of Nightcrawler in this movie is so well done. So, by the way, is... Uh, the, the portrayal in X-Men Apocalypse. I love Nightcrawler and mm-hmm. X-Men Apocalypse, but I just love the character. And they pulled it off. It was wonderful. Yeah, that really, scene when he yeah. bamps out of the, the jet to get to get Rogue and then comes back in, that was amazing. And again, it's one version of him. It doesn't have like the swashbuckle that I love, but like I guess I I compliment the faithfulness of this movie, but I'm complimenting it in like two thousand three dollars. Right. Like you have to convert backwards for like two thousand three levels of faithfulness. This movie was mind blowing. What I vote in favor of some of the same choices that they made today i probably wouldn't but this is 2016 we're in a different world now like there's it it yeah that's that's my caveat for how faithful i claimed it was because obviously they make huge changes to the weapon x origin story and other things but the spirit of it was so new and so faithful for that time yeah, I especially loved Magneto in this film. I loved his escape from prison. There were so many, so many amazing sequences. I remember coming out of the theater. I saw it at the Grommans and just hanging out with like about eight or nine friends, and we just stood there for like a half hour talking about how much we enjoyed the movie. And I, this was in- incredible. So it's truly one of those sequels that really was better than the first film. Um, moving on, let's go to May first, two thousand nine. We saw. Oh, I'm sorry, we're uh, May twenty sixth, two thousand six. Jumping ahead, saw the release of X Men: The Last Stand. This one without Brian Singer, who left to go direct Superman Returns. This film is directed by Brett Ratner, with a script by Simon Kinberg and Zach Penn. This third installment had a cure as the central story, and the division and battle once more between Professor X and Magneto as they fight to stop this cure from wiping themselves out. Uh, Robert, what are your thoughts on X Men: The Last Stand? It's, it's not good. I mean, I, 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 here was the thing that I really objected to. It's like, okay, so Magneto and his friends are just hanging out in the woods. Like, why are they just hanging out in the woods? They're just hanging out there. Like, if you're Magneto and you've got a merry band of mutants, mm-hmm. why the woods? Why don't you like hole up in a luxury hotel somewhere? I mean, I didn't right. understand that. But you can control all, all the elevators. You're Magneto. Uh, you're Magneto. <laughs> also, the thing that I objected to the most is that 
the final battle on Alcatraz when when Magneto says, "Oh, I can just throw these mutants in front of me. They're pawns." He suddenly is completely out of character, and mm -hmm. uh, and it just the whole movie seemed out of character. Like nobody is acting like they're supposed to be acting. It was very odd, and I I never felt like I was watching something real. It felt counterfeit, if that yeah. makes any sense. What Magneto, how he treats Raven, you used to be so beautiful and leaves her behind. He would never do that. Yeah, he would never do. I was angry when I watched this movie. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to agree with you. I felt it was a betrayal of the first two films. I, I felt, uh, and you know, I mean, a lot of people will make light of Brett Ratner coming on to direct it, but you know, I, I think, I think it was like it was under the you know kind of a rush job where it was like they were just trying to fight to finish this film to to make a release date that they already set up. So a lot of things just kind of got glossed over and maybe didn't get that kind of polish that you would have needed. And I think some of the some of the thoughts like like a Magneto betraying his own kind, which would have never happened if you go by the what basically what he did in the first two films. He's like, "Look, we are the homo superior." He would never do that. So the right there, and there's a lot of inconsistencies where it's like they're literally walking across the bridge and it's daytime, and then all of a sudden then it's nighttime in one second. So I mean, those things. I also feel they rushed the Jean Grey, oh. Dark Phoenix, and oh. ruined it. So it's it's sort of like they took two storylines, this Cure storyline and the Dark Phoenix, and wedged them together in a horrible manner that didn't work for either of them. And then you had the movie ended. So it really was kind of this. Oh, we get more Colossus, but really not in a cool way. And oh, we get to finally see these characters like the Juggernaut, but not in a good way. So a lot of the scenes and sequences, plus, let's just be honest, the death of Professor X was horrible and not necessary and stupid. So it didn't work. And the death uh, of Cyclops was almost literally meaningless. Oh, yeah, let's say, let's say I forgot. I almost forgot about the death yeah. of Cyclops because it's forgettable and horrible. So. And they, they gave me the things that should have made me the happiest and it made me the saddest, which hurts more. Like they gave me Kitty Pride, played by Ellen Page. That should have been a dream mm -hmm. scenario. Yep. And, you know, she was okay, but she was in a movie that was not good. So, uh, and hilariously had a romance which I strongly objected to at the time with Bobby but then a couple years later they made them date in the comics anyway so I guess it counts um, also he's gay now uh, hmm. and as it turns out was the whole time but uh, comic stuff aside they gave me Beast right. they gave me uh, Kitty Pride. They, they added stuff to it they tried sort of to do Dark Phoenix they tried to do the Cure storyline which is a, a perfectly valid avenue of like storytelling that's been visited at different times over X-Men history notably in Joss Whedon's Astonishing X-Men run right. like there's a lot of things that could have worked in there, and they just did not. It just, uh, I don't know enough about the behind the scenes to know like whose fault it was. I just right. know what I saw in that theater, and that was a really disappointing movie. Yeah, definitely. Well, we move forward into disappointment. On May 1st, 2009, we saw X-Men Origins Wolverine, the first solo film for you, Jackman, as this character featuring the century-spanning life of Logan and his brother Sabretooth, a.k.a. Victor Creed, played by Lee Schreiber. We see Logan working with Team X with a special Wade Wilson appearance in his early career with Stryker. Then he leaves, kind of gets his own life together, forms a little bit of a, he gets a girlfriend, they're working out, everything's happy. Victor kind of kills her, I think, shows up later. He's out to ruin it. They want to get, you know, they want to get Weapon X back. Uh, we find out lots of strange, inconsistent plot scenes with the Gambit, Blob. You got Deadpool with his mouth sewn shut. What? the f is going on with this movie uh you know i mean i remember seeing it it's just i left the theater like what did i just see i don't even know what this is uh, you had professor x standing at the end like a bizarre cg creepy uncanny valley professor x like come on and get in my quinjet it was weird you got any comments about wolverine origins <laughs> well i don't hate this movie okay i'm gonna say i don't hate it because the beginning of it saves it for me Watching Wolverine and and Sabretooth fighting through different wars, from from like the Civil War, I don't know how is sure. it Civil War, well all the different wars of the 20th century, the trench warfare, right. World War II. I liked all that, and I liked the Victor Creed storyline. I mm -hmm. liked the fact that he was portrayed by Lee Schreiber. I thought that stuff was was worth watching. It's when they horribly botch the superhero elements or the other mutant elements in this mm -hmm. movie that they didn't need, <laughs> you know, uh, frankly. I, you, I, look, I wanted to see Gambit. Okay, that was fine. And, and, and uh, Ryan Reynolds was whatever, at first was fine. Right. But then it just, and I like the idea of a, a team of mutants like they put together fighting 
together. But then it spins off into Unreal Land, where right. where it's like everything that the X Men did correctly, the Wolverine's origin film horribly botches, mm -hmm. and it just becomes annoying at the end where they're fighting on the edge of like the nuclear power plant sure. and all this, and you're like, what? Where are they? They're doing what? Right. Can it please end now? Well, yeah, I yeah. just why am I watching this? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I like that opening too, but that's literally the first five minutes. So it's sort of like <laughs> if you add up the other crappy ninety minutes, you're like, hey, it's like. I, you know, there's a few scenes in the movie that are good. Well, I, yeah, you know? I think I like the first half, and then it just gets... All right, that's fair, Amy. And this is where I get myself in trouble. Uh, I love the X-Men. Mm -hmm. I love the X-Men movies. I haven't watched the Wolverine spinoff films. I used to feel really bad about that till I realized I've been reading X-Men comics for over 20 years now, and I never follow him in his solo adventures. I'm just... That's kind of... For uh, you, Wolverine like, works when he's in the X-Men. I, 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 yeah, he's a he's an interesting dude. I just like him the most when he's with the X-Men. But like, I didn't boycott Origins. It's just that I'd been so burned by X-Men 3 mm. that I kind of never got around to it. And then the completion list in me won't skip a movie. So right. if I watch the Wolverine, I have to watch Origins first. So you can see how it keeps sliding down the You agenda. know what? You got a, over a year and a half. Wait till <laughs> Wolverine 3 is about to come out, or whatever they're going to call it, Wolverine, Old Man, Logan, whatever they're going to call it. Then see these first two, and then see that one. I have a, a sneaky suspicion that that one's gonna be the best of the three. So we'll break some time between now and then, probably, yeah. especially now that I spend a lot more time talking about superhero movies. Totally. So next, moving all moving along, we got May twenty fifth, two thousand eleven, was the release date of X Men First Class. This reboot prequel to the first three X Men films really helped reestablish the X Men brand by throwing them back into the sixties and recasting the main duo of Professor X and Magneto with James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender with Mystique being played by Jennifer Lawrence. This almost James Bondian version directed with stylish flair by Matthew Vaughn revived the franchise and gave us a brand new group of X-Men. Let's talk about X-Men First Class. Now for myself, when I first saw the trailers and things like that, I was like, oh, it has this different flavor and this kind of like 60s James Bond flavor to it, but I wasn't exactly sure how much I would like it. I loved this movie and this was really like, you got X-Men, you got X2, and then you jump like eight or nine years to this movie. And this is the movie that I was like, damn, why did I have to wait like almost a decade to get this kind of flavor? I loved it. I thought Michael Fassbender and James McAvoy, Do Professor X and Magneto, seeing that duo working together to get all the other X-Men, it was so great to see that because you knew that something bad is going to happen to tear that apart. And you see those just being friends and something bad is going to happen. It was great. And also that's what's great to see like, you know, a young mystique because you also know what's going to happen. She's going to side with Magneto. I loved every aspect of uh, first class. How about you, Robert? I love this movie. I mean, there's nothing about this movie I don't love. As a matter of fact, I recently rewatched this knowing we were going to do this recap show. Everything about this movie from the very beginning, I mean, you go back to Auschwitz, you see they even use footage mm -hmm. uh, from the first the, from the first X-Men. But even though it's horrible, you hate Kevin Bacon. Oh, yeah. He's <laughs> such a great villain. Like, he's so awful. When he kills Mag he has Magneto's mother killed right in front of him. Yeah. I mean, it's so... And then you jump and you meet young Xavier and young Mystique as she breaks into young young Charles Xavier's mansion. And right. Per, uh, it's that scene when they meet and the girl they cast to play young Mystique. Perfect. I was in love with her. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to date Mystique? <laughs> I mean, come on. Not that young Mystique. I right. mean, she got older. And then Charles Xavier is kind of like a baller where he goes and he hits on girls using his mutant powers. <laughs> right. And then there's even the scene where, where Xavier and Magneto go into a strip club to find the, our other character with wings. Right. And they're drinking and, hello, Vicka, and all that. I mean... And, and and the Hellfire Club has a submarine. Yeah. Come on. They have a submarine. It's awesome. One of my favorite sequences was actually Magneto Nazi Hunter. When he's yeah. like, that's just like, that's so badass. You're like, because you see all this horrible stuff with him and Auschwitz, like you mentioned, and then years later, he's like, I'm hunting all of you down. It's like, it's pulled right out of a comic book. Right, One he's of the, unrepentant uh, about oh yeah. it. He's, it's such, that scene is great. It's total flavor. Amy? I, first class. I adore this movie. This was me being like, no, it can be great again. And like, I mean, massive deviations from continuity. The the new generation of like what we now consider to be the first X-Men. It's all just like, what? Who? Angel from the Grant Morrison run? Mm -hmm. what? Wow. But the thing is like, they were just like, I don't know, try something. And this is that time where it was like, and it worked yeah. brilliantly. Like the second they said it was going to be in the 60s, I got massively excited for this movie and I, I like 
the the idea of doing a period piece to return it to again like the ideas and stories that are at the heart of the x-men that's what i'm there for and the character relationships and so even though you ma changed a bunch of stuff about the story you successfully rescued that core of what the x-men is supposed to be about pulled off the like the miracle of perfect casting for charles and magneto again mm -hmm. right. how how <laughs> yeah. did that happen but like watching those two have a real relationship that you care about is unbelievably great and for just to pay off all of my complaining about black leather look at that orange i mean yellow <laughs> i know colors right. yellow and black uh, they are wearing yellow and black, yeah. and if you can imagine what my heart did sitting in that theater when they came out in their yellow and black oh, yeah. uniforms, I was just like, yes, it was a long con. It was 10 years yeah. of getting people ready for some yellow and black outfits on your X-Men. Amy is referring to the original X-Men from the 60s. Their outfits were yellow and black. A lot of people forget that. So and it was definitely. Yeah. And there's, so, so much there's some weaknesses with the, the bad guys, but I don't really care because the movie succeeds at all the stuff that I really wanted it to do. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But the, I really like the spy element, too. Totally. The fact that Moira McTaggart works for the CIA, you know, and she's undercover. Yeah. When you first meet her, she goes into the Hellfire Clubs. She takes off her clothes and is scantily clad and just does just jumps right into the fray. Mm -hmm. And she was cool. I'm like, I'll see a Moira McTaggart movie now. And, I know. and everything about I would have the always film, seen a Moira McTaggart movie. It was nice to see that like It was yeah. great. And 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 you know, you had Oliver Platt who was running the, the other division. Well, you can come stay in my place. And you actually saw these kids learning. Mm -hmm. Like they were all when they were put together in a room. That was great. That was like the X-Men are in school. We're waiting to see that kind of thing. Right. The From training their... sequences yeah, and absolutely. stuff with Havoc and all that. That was great. I loved all those things. Yeah, it was really nice to see some of the X-Men that we hadn't seen before in this film. Moving forward, I mean, so now we have kind of the rebirth and the, the revival of the X-Men franchise with X-Men First Class. We have a second Wolverine movie coming out July 26th, 2013. And this one, this time we followed Logan to Japan as he tried to escape from his tormented nightmares involving the ghost of Jean Grey. Wolverine is, accepts the offer from a man that he saved during World War II. Now this guy can give Logan what he truly desires, which is death, which is the escape from his healing gene where he feels like he doesn't want to live anymore. We, we enter this movie with a very morose and kind of beat down, kind of homeless looking Wolverine hanging out with uh, D CG bears. Uh, things that don't go really to, according to plan, uh, but end up with Wolverine not fi not fighting a group of ninjas, but instead eventually battling the Silver Samurai and uh, the cosplay Viper character. This was directed by James Mangold, and to, to me, honestly, this film was successful for its first hour and maybe 15 minutes, and then the last 30 minutes just fell apart. It literally, from when he didn't fight the ninjas to the very end, it just felt like I was watching a different movie. I didn't even know what I was watching anymore when he was fighting the Silver Samurai and the Viper uh, Acid Girl. Is I, I just really honestly like, what did this movie just fall into? And then it ended. So it was really disappointing on that aspect. So what are your thoughts on Wolverine, Robert? I feel exactly the same way. I mean, uh, it, it there's a thing I think when these movies are being developed, when they're being written, that they have to have this weird super-powered conflict at the end of mm. the film. And this movie was pretty naturalistic for most of it. I mm -hmm. mean, I love the scene where Wolverine is at the funeral and he's chasing the assassin through, right. uh, through the city streets and all that. And it feels really grounded and very realistic. And then you get to the, the end of the film and I was waiting for a big ninja battle right. because everything is better with ninjas if they're played well. Right. You know, there's a there's a whole army of ninjas that take Wolverine down in this movie, and then he gets taken up to this castle, mm -hmm. and all of that was just nonsense. I wanted to see him battle the hand. I wanted to see him fight like a hundred really well trained ninjas. Hey, you mean like the Chris Claremont Frank Miller uh, Wolverine <laughs> series where he's supposed to fight ninjas? And here's one other thing before we jump over to you, Amy, the trailer for this Wolverine movie called The Wolverine showed him fighting ninjas. Showed him on the top of some, you know, of a building with a cigar and there's like 30 ninjas on the ground and there's a massive explosion of him fighting a ninja on a bike. And then you see this movie and that's not in the movie. Not even any, none of it. 
there's a shot of him running and there's some ninjas on some roofs and they all hit him with like 30 arrows and he passes out and then he fights and then he's like in this like mad scientist laboratory I was like what happened to the ninja battle and then we're like told later oh that's going to be on some director's cut I'm like I don't care about that I want to see that that's what this movie is supposed to have well to be fair the director's cut of this is a much better movie no I heard that you know I, I actually don't bought forget. it I still have not watched it's it yet, much better so I, I am eventually going to see the ninjas fight Wolverine I just haven't seen that yet because I saw the movie that was released, which didn't have it. Amy, what are your thoughts on the Wolverine? I'm looking forward to this one more than I'm looking forward to Origins. Right. Uh, because I, basically for the reason that uh, most people seem to have enjoyed most of it. Um, but I'll confine my comments to the fact that the original uh, run is available as one of the Wolverine classics kind of trade paperbacks at your local comic book Definitely store. check it out. <laughs> it's Wolverine. He's on the cover. Frank Miller. And Chris Claremont rocked it, and you can actually experience Wolverine fighting ninjas in comic book form. <laughs> Moving on, we have X-Men Days of Future Past. This came out May 23rd, 2014. This was the return to greatness, with Brian Singer making an epic return and making an epic that combined his original cast with the cast of the first class, traveling back and forth between the horrible future to the, set, to the 1970s in an effort to save all of mutant kind this movie had it all both sets of x-men time travel the ability to fix giant mistakes that happened in the previous movies as well as getting the sentinels done properly finally in the x universe i gotta say i absolutely loved this movie i thought it was incredibly well written it was amazingly directed all of the action sequences worked but what's more important to me was the actual emotional content of the interaction within the care with the characters both the future set of the X-Men and the past set where you basically use Wolverine as the tying point between both of these, uh, the future and the past. It's really a, an incredible film and amazingly well done. What are your thoughts, Amy? I love this movie. Uh, I, I love it the most for successfully executing a version of a specific classic X-Men story. Um, so as an adaptation, uh, it, it, Put across the story of like it, which is only two issues in the original X Men run, but right. became two of the most famous issues of any comic ever written because they were so effective. Um, and you know, as a Kitty Pride fan, it hurts me that she's not at the center of the story. But that's how I know how good the movie was. I don't even mind. Mm -hmm. I don't even mind that they changed it up for their characters and their circumstances. It made perfect sense to send Wolverine. Uh, and here's where like. The movie verse has started to make real positive contributions to X Men canon at large because the movie version of Mystique is better than the comic book version. I've always loved comic book Mystique, right. but like we get, it's it's kind of a great innovation that she's got this relationship with Xavier now, uh, and it it adds better attention to her villainy or not villainy. And you just like I again I love the period piece setting. I love mm -hmm. the execution of that. Uh, it. I would love for this movie to have been four times as long so I could see more of the future and more of the new characters that they introduced there. Uh, but but it was a really successful movie and it made me really happy. Robert? Same thing. I mean, it opens... First of all, you've got your Terminator future totally. where bodies are being dumped and people are running through the wreckage of, of New York and <laughs> sentinel ships are flying all over the place, yeah. dropping sentinels down. I mean, it, it was just as bad as it was in the comic. I mean, it was that future was not a future I ever wanted to be in. But then you go right into, for the very first time, a kick-ass mutant battle where these mutants are using their powers. You get to even see some new mutants. I mean, right. sunspots in there. They're fighting these sentinels as they're coming in. You, you know, a bishop is there. I'm like, yeah, bishop with his cool gun that gets charged up with the red energy. And I loved seeing that. That's what everybody wanted to see was that mutant, those mutant battles. Un you, you see Iceman create the ice bridge. I mean, it was awesome. Colossus. Colossus was great. I mean, and what happens to them? Then they all get killed. Right. You're gonna watch all the X-Men die, just like the cover of that second issue with all the X-Men, wa the wanted posters, deceased, deceased, deceased. Yeah, Google the covers of these two issues. They are very, very famous. They've been imitated a million times, and there's a reason. Yeah, it was great. Chris and, and, Claremont and John Byrne, yeah? Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, it again, then the movie is so wildly entertaining. You get an action scene at the beginning because a lot of this movie just takes place in rooms, people mm -hmm. talking, and it's great. People, I love that you see depressed you know, Xavier and, and Hank, they're kind of alone. It's almost like Grey Gardens or something with mutants. Yeah. <laughs> and and they're there and, and Wolverine shows up and it's and then of course you have the Quicksilver scene. Oh. Yeah. 
So and the fantastic. quicks with, with time in a bottle, and, oh. and it's so well done. All of it is so well done. Yeah, that Quicksilver scene is is probably going to go down in, in cinematic history as one of the the most amazing sequences ever put to film. It's so entertaining and fun, and just every just the actor, I believe his name's Ev, uh, Evan, Evan Peters. Evan Peters, great actor to, that they selected to play Quicksilver. And I remiss to uh, mention that the X Men First Class had an incredibly funny cameo. With Wolverine, when like basically <laughs> Professor X and Magneto were going about trying to recruit some uh, some mutants, one guy got to use the f bomb, and then in Days of Future Past they got to flip it, where he's like, "Remember what you told me?" He had a, a pissed off Professor X telling Wolverine to go, you know, and somebody f and so. somebody in Apocalypse, <laughs> yes, gets to do that too. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think uh, I think you know, aside from that, I mean, I loved Days of Future Past. I thought it was a fantastically well paced. Amazingly well written, well directed film, and it really amped me up for the X Men films and all the future ones. Uh, moving forward, we had Deadpool. Comes it came out this year, February twelfth, two thousand sixteen. They really literally crushed the box office over seven hundred million dollars. The biggest R rated movie ever on the planet. And it's Deadpool. No one ever would have thought that in a million years. No one ever would have been like, yes, I predict a Deadpool. I don't know. I think you comedy. did. No, I predict. Show. I did actually predict that it would break 100 million. What's up, everybody? Um, but uh, yeah, you know, the reason I even felt that way is because all of those, uh, their incredible marketing campaign was was crossing over to everyone. It wasn't just comic book fans, but it was literally anybody who enjoys having a good time at the movies was like, I am gonna laugh when I go see this film. And that was a promise that was kept. I thought it was an incredibly entertaining film, had just the right amount of action, had just the right, right amount of humor. You could really thank Ryan Reynolds. He fought to play Wade Wilson in Deadpool. Since he got cast, I believe it was in 2003 when he first started developing the, the, the Deadpool character. And then obviously he was brought in to Wolverine Origins and that didn't work out. And the script that they had was sitting around for like literally six years. And he fought and fought to get this film made the right way, rated with you know an R. And I thought that Tim Miller did an incredible job. I thought Paul Wernick and Reed, 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 Reese wrote an incredible screenplay. And it was adapted perfectly by Miller. I mean, this is one of those things where you're like, leave him alone. Give him a small budget. You are going to get an incredible return. What a bang for your buck. Robert, your thoughts on Deadpool? Well, I loved it. I mean, I loved everything about it. And what's really interesting is how they turned this sort of meta, crazy film that they were making into an X-Men film. Yeah. I mean, I loved Negasonic Teenage Warhead. I loved Colossus in this movie. This was the, the first time we see the classic mm. Colossus right out of the X-Men comics. Totally. Who was the straight man who was funny. I mean, I loved all of that, and they, they, it was great, and it, it worked for me as another X-Men movie. I mean, it fits right in, even though it's completely its own thing. It was its own thing, and it fit right in, which is an amazing feat for a film like this. And totally. it was so monumentally, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a love story. It really is a story about you know this guy who just loves his girlfriend, and, and he just wants to be with her. That's the whole movie. Yeah. And it's uh, it's great. Uh, you wouldn't think if you read this on paper that it would work, but it just every bit of this movie works so very well, and it's so much fun to watch. And it came out on Blu-ray today. Yep, <laughs> today is the day that you can actually purchase Deadpool and watch like a ton of extra features. Watch T.J. Miller riff for twenty minutes. I would check it out if you if you liked Deadpool, get that Blu-ray. Amy, your thoughts on Deadpool? Uh, man, did I never think that I'd be sitting around reviewing the X-Men film franchise and being like, a bright spot is the Deadpool movie. I like, know, right? <laughs> what? I, and it's, it's because I, he's never been my favorite character, but like eight years of working in a shop will teach you very quickly that he's a lot of people's favorite character. So it became very, very important to me that they get this right, because I know a lot of people whose hearts are in this, uh, in a very, like... It's hilarious that a character like Deadpool, you're talking about someone's heart being in it because he's supposed to be about irreverence and senseless violence and all this stuff. But that's not really the thing that people have fallen in love with. It's like, it's this, this personality, which as we saw in the movie, has a ton of heart. Like, so watching the movie, I had, there are logic questions. Why would the X-Men be trying so hard to recruit this guy exactly? He's running around murdering a bunch of people. Those logic questions don't really matter in the end. Like, I just enjoyed, I was like, all right, fine, they want him, cool. Uh, I want to see Colossus be awesome, which he was. I want to see T Negasonic Teenage Warhead be awesome, which she was. Uh, I want to see the mansion. It, like, I, I loved a lot of stuff about it, and the stuff that, like, 
Did the villain make the most sense in the world? Maybe not. Right. Was that the point of that movie? No. Uh, it made me laugh. It made a lot of people laugh really hard, and it felt like Deadpool, and it really, really delivered. I, again, I'm, I'm a broken record about, like, faithful to the idea behind Deadpool on just a, a crazy, or the idea that Deadpool evolved into, like, via the work of Daniel Wade and, and uh, Joe Kelly Definitely. and a bunch of talented people. I, I like that you mentioned that. It's like, I'm forgiving with Deadpool and how the villain didn't really come, like didn't really make a lot of sense towards the end because it was so much fun. Yeah, just like literally didn't getting matter. there didn't matter. And it was like, it kind of, it was almost a throwaway. It was like, I brought, packed up all these guns. Oh, I forgot them. You know what I mean? It's sort of one of these things where it just, so it really, it really worked. All the action sequences, they just had the, just the right amount of flavor and action to them where you didn't get bored. So I thought it was one of those things where the restraint that they had really worked forward towards the movie and they picked their they picked their battles i mean from the opening slow motion the sequence the opening sequence is so great i mean there's so many little <laughs> sequences in that film that just are perfect uh, definitely check out Deadpool. And that leads us in our X-Men Odyssey, this road to Apocalypse, to X-Men Apocalypse, which comes out May 27th in the States, here in the United States of America. And every, every other country on the planet gets to see it May 18th. Boo! What the hell's other going countries. on here? Hey, everybody, what's up? Remember, we shoot this in America, so of course... All of you people who live not in America get to see it a week early. Um, now, Robert and I have already seen the film. We got a chance to check it twice. out. Robert's already seen it twice. <laughs> Amy hasn't seen it yet. We are going to give a really quick, non-spoiler uh, look into X-Men Apocalypse. Robert, your thoughts on X-Men Apocalypse? I love this movie. I, I unabashedly love this film. It To me, it, it has a lot of, as you would say, it has a lot of comic book flavor. Mm -hmm. Probably more comic book flavor than any other X-Men movie oh, yeah. previously. Uh, I think the first half of this film is absolutely fantastic. Yes. I think that there's, I really love, a lot of people are saying that the villain is underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. I love the the villain because he's he's completely alien to our modern world. And he doesn't understand it. He's kind of walking around in a daze like, what is all of this? It's almost like he's walked into a uh, a bunch of mosquitoes. Like he's out, he's out in a swamp somewhere and he just wants all those mosquitoes mm -hmm. gone. He wants to build a house and turn the swamp into a nice place to live. That's kind of what he wants to do, and he doesn't understand anything that's happening. And I like that. I thought it was really interesting. And I and the fact is, he does think he's a god. Mm -hmm. He's been around for a long, long, long time, and he thinks we're all idiots, right? Which we are. Well, Apocalypse gets his. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but I'll say I like the film. I say go in there with medium expectations. I mean, if you have to put it on the, like some kind of wall against Batman v Superman: Civil War. And for myself, I was disappointed with Batman v Superman and loved Civil War. This is somewhere in the middle where there's a lot of sequences in X-Men Apocalypse, which are incredible. I mean, you're already, you've seen the trailer. You already know there's a Quicksilver scene. And we already talked about a, the Quicksilver scene that's in Days of Future Past. This rivals it, but it's totally different. But it's also incredibly enjoyable. There's uh, the entire brand new group of mutants that you get to see again. A reintroduction of Nightcrawler, of Jean Grey, of Cyclops. And they are done note perfect. I think for myself, Me I too. loved seeing Scott Summers done right. He gets the right amount of screen time. I think the relationship that you see develop with him and Jean Grey, the introduction of, of Nightcrawler, I think all of those things are done perfectly. And for myself, I wish I could have seen more of that and less of Apocalypse. So unfortunately for myself, I agree with you. The opening of the film, the first half of that movie is fantastic. And then it starts to, for myself, fall apart into a mishmash of, you know, why can he do this, but he can't do that? And what's this? And why is he doing this? And why is this character doing that? Things that just didn't add up and felt like maybe if it was 20 minutes even shorter, the ending, I wouldn't have been questioning so much of it. But I can't say that that detracted completely from the film for me. I felt like it was a really enjoyable film. It wasn't like a you know an A for me or like a 90%. I could definitely recommend it and say, you've got to see this film. And I'll, I'm planning on seeing it again. So I thought it was it was a good film, but there were some parts that didn't make sense to me at the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, I really, really like the film. I think you're going to really like the film. Amy, I I've think... seen a lot of reviews where they're sort of like, there'll be a lot in here that fans will enjoy. And I was like, okay, so I'm that person. I am um, cool. Well, I'm lowering yeah. my expectations, but I'm still really, really yeah, like, I, want, I need to see these characters. That's I need all to it see is. It's like, I, honestly, I think lowering your expectations, you'll enjoy it more because I think if you go in there expecting to get the something... I, so I don't first class was so awesome because we were like, oh, wait, it's great. Right. You're blown <laughs> away by it. I don't think it's as good as Days of Future Past. To me, 
that is the best X-Men film. For myself, I think that's the best X-Men film. And this one is like under uh, first class. So for myself, I was gonna rank these films. It would be like Days of Future Past, um, First Class, X2, X-Men Apocalypse would come in fourth in my rankings. Well, I think another thing that I think that are, is sort of throwing people is as much as the X-Men are about mutant powers, they've always been about really two dudes and their conflict. Mm -hmm. Magneto has always been this guy who you're fighting against, who's, he's a man. I mean, he's a mutant and he's got incredible powers, but he's a guy and all of the X-Men films, even the villains have been people. Mm -hmm. Whereas Apocalypse isn't really a person mm -hmm. and he sort of propels the film into a different, it's a lot less grounded because See, you you're know, dealing with an, a villain that's in a much more fantastical realm. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the reasons my, I have some complaints about it because like you said, Magneto is such a grounded character. Michael Fassbender brings such an amazing depth to that character, whereas this Apocalypse character, it's harder to you know even get into it. So Right, and I think that's what a lot of people are bumping on. They're bumping on the fact that this is a character that they can't relate to. Even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even with a villain like Loki, he's a wise, he's a god, but he's a wise cracking dude. Right. You know, that's that you buy into. Whereas we haven't seen a overtly, we haven't, I, I, it made me wonder how Thanos is going to work mm. as a villain. No, because if sure. Thanos is a god, how do you make that god relatable to your audience? Definitely. And it's a tough. It's really hard to do villains like this. Well, let's go. Let's go into ranking your top. Your top five X Men films from this group. Amy, we'll start with you. Ooh. Uh. Hate choosing between my babies. Um. It's probably gonna be. Oh, come back to me. All right, I don't Robert. Know. Uh. Well, I'm probably gonna have to go with Days of Future Past as number one. Um, I would, I would, you know what? I almost want to say, well, Days of Future Past 1, X2-2, two, two, First Class 3, the, uh, Apocalypse 4, and probably X-Men 5. Sure, I didn't add X-Men 5 as my fifth, but that would be my fifth, and ours are just flipped as far as First right. Class and X2. How about you, Amy? It's probably going to be you guys'. I, I, I think I need to do a big rewatch and do them back to back so I can try to evaluate, but totally. it, it's tough. Again, it's, it's $2,003 versus... Like, Days of Future Past, I think, is better, but did X2 accomplish something more meaningful for its time for me? Like, that's what's going to determine right. where they land for me. I also want to watch uh, First Class, Days of Future Past, and Apocalypse all at once. Mm. I mean, I think that's going to be a very satisfying trilogy. I think this, I mean, what X-Men Apocalypse really does well is set the X-Men up. And it's, a, it's not like like uh, Justice League where, you know, or the Batman v Superman where like, we're getting weird little clips of a video of Cyborg or something. This film actually sets up the new X-Men in an incredible way where I'm really excited to see the next X-Men movie. Right. And I keep hearing like Simon Kinberg just announced like, yeah, the next X-Men movie is going to be set in the 90s. I'm like, can you start making it now? <laughs> I'm tired of this, like having to wait four years or whatever. Like, just get on it because all of us love these new X-Men. We want to see another X-Men movie with Jean Grey, with Nightcrawler, with the new Cyclops. It's a fantastic new cast that can I cannot wait to see them move forward into the 90s or whatever. I know they're doing the new Mutants next. So we've got we've got Wolverine 3. We've got Deadpool 2. We've got another X-Men movie. We've got new Mutants coming up. We've got a lot of more X-Men films coming up in the next few years. I want to wrap up by thanking my guests on this road to apocalypse. Robert Meyer Burnett, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett, or you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM, or on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. Nice. Amy Dallin, where can we find you online? I'm on Twitter as EnthusiAmy, uh, and I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Amy Dallin, where I have a show called Future Girl, and you can find me over at Geek and Sundry. Awesome. And I'm John Schnepp. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Thanks for checking out this Collider Heroes special, Road to X-Men Apocalypse. Uh, we'll see you uh, online. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.